Good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Kachikian with the Black Hills Regional Eye Institute. And here we have a case of a very dense cataract. This is a very advanced cataract, kind of an amber fibrotic nucleus. And on exam, you can tell that even the anterior capsule is contracted and kind of scarred down and become very fibrotic. So we will begin the case by using some tripan blue to stain the capsule. Initially, I inject the tripan blue under air in an attempt to stain the anterior capsule. And for most cases, that works fairly well. It is not my preferred uh, technique, but it is certainly easier than placing the tripan blue under viscoelastic, which is my preferred technique. But in this case, I found that just staining the anterior capsule of this lens with tripan blue under air didn't really provide me the staining I was looking for. I could tell this was going to be a fairly difficult case with a lot of extensive uh, nucleus disassembly. And so I wanted to be very clear about where the edge of the capsule was throughout the entire case. is also likely to be a longer case. And what happens over Longer cases is the tripan blue on the anterior capsule can fade, and then it becomes diff difficult to see the anterior capsule very well. So I wound up staining again under viscoelastic, which I think gives a darker stain if you can paint the anterior capsule with the tripan blue. The staining it becomes very dense. So we place the tripan blue under the capsule, paint the anterior capsule with the tripan blue, and then uh, irrigate it out. We reinflate with viscoelastic, and then you can see there's some denser staining, especially centrally there. And then we will begin our capsular excess. Normally, I'll begin the capsular excess with the utrata, but given that that band of contraction that you can see there, right in the center of the capsule, I elected to use a cystotome because it was difficult to tell how much trouble I would have piercing the anterior capsule with just the utrata. So we initiate with the cystotome and then continue the capsular axis with the utrata. In these cases, I do try and get a, probably a larger capsular axis than average. I think it provides a little more room to work with since there is going to be some extensive nuclear disassembly. You also can stretch the capsular axis a little bit more when it's bigger and there in these cases there's a lot of lateral nuclear stretching in order to disassemble the nucleus properly and get some of those leathery fibrotic pieces apart to be able to get them out. So the capsular axis proceeds really uneventfully. It's nice and round, it's centered, and it's fairly large. And we use our BSS to liberate uh, the nucleus and, and do hydrodissection. Given how fibrotic the lens is, it's unlikely that there is a lot of cortical material that is going to separate from the lens. Uh, it's probably all just scarred down and adherent. And so the lens does rotate very freely. We'll put some viscoelastic on the surface of the cornea. Again, that's good in a case that is going to be longer than average so that the cornea doesn't dry out and you don't have to keep re-irrigating. And then we'll fill the anterior chamber with the viscoelastic and also try and get some viscoelastic under the anterior capsule and around the nucleus because we will do a chop uh, technique here. And having an adequate amount of space doing your visco dissection, having an adequate amount of space for the second instrument, the chopper, to go out under the capsule is important. We'll initiate with um, some high vacuum kind of quadrant removal to clear the tip of the phaco, phaco port, phaco handpiece, and then we'll begin our chop. And we go straight to chop here because um, sculpting is going to prove to be 
kind of ineffectual. It's nice to have a little groove and a place to put your chopper, but clearly sculpting in this nucleus is, is not going to be the best way to disassemble it. And so the way I like to proceed here is kind of going in a clockwise fashion, chopping each piece. And basically what that means is I actually rotate the lens counterclockwise and keep the chopper at about 12 o'clock and just continue to chop piece after piece. And what you'll find is that there's not a ton of separation initially. The lens is so fibrotic that the pieces don't separate and you can just see kind of, you do get kind of a partial chop, but then I move on to the next section and keep doing that. Because what happens is eventually, after you do enough of these chops, you'll either get a central piece of nucleus free, or one of the smaller chopped pieces will free up, and that will give you some space. So I get the second instrument out over the periphery of the lens, and I do try to kind of scratch it into the surface of the lens to make sure that I am under that anterior capsule. So I kind of scratch the surface of the lens, make sure I am down under the capsule, then I go out and try and propagate the chop. And then that was a, a very good one actually. You can see that it went almost posteriorly. It kind of gets hung up in the center where it's densest, but that was a very good chop. And there's another one with a lot of stretching. You can see that lateral stretching of the lens. I do find that lateral movements are very well tolerated inside the eye. You know, when you're going deep, you do have to be careful, but when you're stretching laterally, putting pressure laterally, uh, because of that zonular support is lateral, you're pushing into support, uh, which is more forgiving, basically. And there's a piece coming out. So there's the first piece. And again, none of the chops were perfect. None of the chops propagated 100%. Uh, through uh, the anterior and posterior portions of the lens, but as you go around doing carouseling the lens, doing the chops, you know, by the time you make it uh, 360 degrees around, a piece will free up. And if it doesn't, you just keep going around until something does. And so there you've got your first piece of the lens out, basically. And you can see there's no cortical material there. That's straight through to posterior capsule. So then you want to be careful. You want to refill with viscoelastic. Make sure you're protecting that posterior capsule. Make sure you're protecting the corneal endothelium in, in its entirety. But we've got, you know, almost a quadrant out now. And we're going to continue to do the same thing. We're going to rotate to where we can get a piece in front of the phaco tip. We're going to chop it as many times as is necessary to free up a section and then take that section. And you'll notice here I'm not really using any longitudinal ultrasound. I probably could have in this case. I think a little bit of longitudinal ultrasound would have helped uh, evacuate the pieces from the eye a little bit faster and emulsify them faster, uh, but I just elected not to do that in this case. You will find that I use the chopper almost like a saw, you know, pushing and mechanically dismantling each piece to get through those fibrotic um, kind of tendrils that hold it together. You know, back and forth, just sawing. That sawing motion is is can somewhat can be somewhat helpful. And then you'll see here we've evacuated some viscoelastic from the eye. It's coming out of the side port incision, and I could see that it went into the phaco handpiece. And so shortly we'll want to refill with viscoelastic again. And that's something that I do really without hesitation. Um, Reinflating the eye with viscoelastic. Uh, is a very safe way to proceed. It adds a little bit of time to the case, but it would not take anywhere near as much time as the vitrectomy. So viscoelastic is your friend. What you'll see happen there is that I was pushing posteriorly and the pupil came down, and that's a warning sign. Don't push anymore. Make your movements laterally. And so I relaxed from me from pushing posteriorly and kind of resumed moving laterally. And so again, we'll reinflate with our viscoelastic, making sure to coat the endothelium, expand the iris, and protect the posterior and anterior capsule. You can go right through that crevice there to get some 
viscoelastic material behind the lens, which is important because when there's no cortical material back there, uh, that and you're doing a lot of vacuum, that lens will, or that posterior capsule will pop up anteriorly uh, into the phago handpiece, and, and then you'll have an open posterior capsule. Here's another piece being removed slowly but surely uh, in these types of lenses. There's a lot of splintering that goes on, so you get a lot of little pieces uh, that come out. Just rotate the lens and repeat the same process. Grab it, chop it, a little sawing motion. Again, as I said, it is always very helpful. Just kind of saw back and forth between the handpiece and the phaco tip to break the pieces. What happens if, if you don't break them apart, then you're trying to pull one piece of the lens that's still connected to the remainder of the lens up and it pulls the entire lens up, which isn't what you want. It puts more stress on the capsular bag, which isn't what you want. You're pulling up then the lens and the capsule and the posterior capsule as well. So you're really trying to liberate each piece individually and use as much viscoelastic as you need to to protect the other structures of the eye. Sometimes I'll also use the viscoelastic just to see, you know, if something has changed. Is there a rupture to the posterior capsule? Can I stick the visco back there? Uh, is it filling the bag or is it is it going posteriorly? And so in a case like that, like this, that, that is very important. The other thing that I do when I use a lot of viscoelastic or it's a really dense lens is I give the patients a, a diamox in the postoperative area to kind of ward off any pressure spikes that might come from uh, viscoelastic in blocking the trabecular meshwork or in Schlem's canal. I think when you repeatedly put viscoelastic in the eye for dense cataracts, that visco makes its way, you know, through the trabecular meshwork into Schlem's canal and all the IA in the world doesn't get that viscoelastic out. So that's where I think the diamox is helpful. Here we keep our second instrument back and remove the last piece of lens. You'll notice too that throughout the case, the second instrument stays posteriorly to the phaco tip in order to prevent any capsular rupture. Now we will take our IA, and although there's not much cortex, there are a few pieces uh, of kind of sticky cortex that stick uh, to the fornix of the capsular bag, so we'll go out and grab those in an attempt to make sure that we've got as much of the lens out as we can. And leaving a little bit of cortex behind isn't unreasonable, but these pieces here, they're large. They're going to expand once they hydrate, and you do not want to find them uh, the following day in the post-op. So you want to make sure to do your best to get as much of that cortical material that's in the fornix of the capsular bag out the other thing that I will often do is use a BSS and almost like a power wash into the fornix of the capsular bag to try and free up, like just like that, any retained cortical material. And usually going through the side port and irrigating through the main incision is enough to find any pieces of sticky cortex uh, that are in the posterior capsule that are in the capsular fornix. You can power wash pretty firmly and it rarely uh, causes damage to the capsular bag. Now that we're fairly certain that there's no more cortical material, we can reinflate the eye with a provisc and place our lens. If you want to be aggressive, you can try and grab some of those wispy pieces of fibrotic lens attached to the posterior capsule. Given that none of those were in the central visual axis, I elected to leave them in this case. You can see that CDE is 22.6. That is uh, very high uh, in, in my case. Now I'm checking to see if there's any remaining cortex anywhere that we haven't identified. 
and the capsular bag appears to be pretty clean. There's a little piece there. But the form of the capsular bag, almost 360 degrees, appears to be very clean, which is what we want. Now we will take our IOL and inject it. Sometimes with this auto lens, that front habit comes out straight. I just bend it with the second instrument and place it into the capsule bag. Use a Sinsky to unfold the lens, usually or to assist in unfolding and centration. So the lens otherwise for me sometimes just takes too long to unfold and I don't appreciate waiting for that and then we'll get our IA. I always go behind the lens initially um, when I do the IA to get as much probisc out from behind the lens as possible. You can even attempt to get that little piece of lens material stuck on the capsular bag there. And then we'll remove the viscoelastic from the anterior portion of the eye and make sure the lens is centered. You can see there is going to be fairly good overlap of the capsular axis on the lens, which will help in, with stability and centration. Again, this is a larger capsular axis because of the density of the lens. I just wanted to have the working room, but we'll try and make sure that the lens itself has fairly good overlap with the capsule. We'll hydrate our incision, incisions gently, place some moxifloxacin to minimize the risk of endophthalmitis and make sure our incisions are sealed. And in a little under 20 minutes, we've taken a patient who is essentially uh, blind and restored them to normal vision. These cases take a little bit longer, uh, but use taking your time using additional viscoelastic is 10 times better uh, than being too aggressive and uh, having some sort of complication. All right. I hope you folks found this useful. We'll see you next time.